You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you further. You step forward little by little, not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. I am Nick Peters, your host, seeking to bring you your very best in Christian scholarship and apologetics. And today, we're going into some church history in a subject of church history we haven't really looked at before. Now, today, in our political landscape, we know that if you want to insert Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or anyone else, what you do is you say they are Hitler. Hitler is everyone's bad boy in history. He's the one that we always come to. Well, if you're looking at church history, usually if any group wants to present a problem in church history, they go to the bad boy of church history, and that is Constantine. Everything has gone wrong with Constantine. Or has it? Maybe it hasn't gone wrong. And my guest, in fact, is here to talk with us about that. His name is Peter Lightheart. Who is he? He is the president of the Theopolis Institute, a study center and leadership training institute in Birmingham, Alabama. He's an ordained minister. He serves as teacher at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Birmingham. He is the author of several books, including Defending Constantine and most recently, The End of Protestantism. He and his wife, Noel, have ten children and nine grandchildren. And today, we're going to be talking about his book, Defending Constantine. Have we got him wrong in church history? So, uh, Dr. Lightheart, welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. Thanks very much. Great to be here. Now, if my audience hasn't heard or you doesn't know who you are, tell us a bit about how you got to be doing what you're doing. Well, I uh, I, I, I taught for many years at a, at a Christian college, uh, New St. Andrews College in Moscow, Idaho. Mm-hmm. Uh and uh, have recently moved to Birmingham, Alabama, as you said, to start the Theopolis Institute. And um, Theopolis is uh, intended to be an institute to support the Reformation and renewal of the church, and particularly in the areas of Bible, liturgy, and culture. And so I've been interested for a long time in the intersection of Christianity and politics, and uh, that's the subject of the Constantine book. I got got into it a little bit... um, a number of years ago when I wrote a little book called Against Christianity, and it was challenging certain understandings, privatized understandings of Christian faith. And um, the last part of the book was a um, was a chapter on Constantine. It was a more theoretical defense of Constantine than a historical one, but the, the larger book, uh, Defending Constantine, was a historical uh, support for the the more theological defense that I gave in against Christianity. Mm-hmm. Now, when we're talking about Constantine, we can't just like, jump straight to Constantine as if where Jesus comes, he does his ministry, he dies and rises again. And then lo and behold, here's Constantine who shows up on the scene. H- how did we get to Constantine to begin with? Yeah. The, well, I mean, there's a longer and a shorter way to tell that story. Of course, um, uh, the, the um, the basic situation for the early church from the time of the apostles on was uh, that they were an, uh, their their legal legal standing was at least ambiguous for much of the first three centuries of the church of, church, of the church's history. Uh, that it wasn't a period of constant persecution. That's uh, some popular ideas or some uh, the, you had the popular idea that uh, Christians were always under threat and the Roman emperors were always persecuting Christians which is not the case. They were sporadic, uh, sometimes localized. A fair bit of the persecution that took place in the early centuries was not directed from Rome, but would be more or less spontaneous mob action, like you see in the book of Acts with uh, Stephen. Or they, it would be directed by uh, provincial, regional uh, governors, officials of the Roman Empire, and not directed from Rome. 
Uh, but that the ambiguity of the legal status was itself kind of a threat. You, you, know, you think about the situation in certain countries today where Christians exist uh, and they operate fairly freely, but they never know when there's going to be a crackdown and they never know when the uh, the government's going to get alarmed and try to shut down the churches. And that was the that was the unsettled situation of the early church for most of the first three centuries. Um, but it, over the course of the over the course of that time, I, I think the, there, there are a couple things that go on. One of the one of the complaints against Constantine is that he betrayed the Church of the Martyrs. Uh, the Church of the Martyrs was a minority within the Roman Empire. They stood in opposition to the Roman Empire, and often did so at the at their cost of their lives. And so, um, the argument is that Constantine, by uh, Christianizing or beginning the process of Christianizing the empire betrayed the the, uh, the suffering of the martyrs. But I, I think that there's much more continuity between uh, the martyrs and the martyr church and Constantine. And over the course of the first several centuries, during these sporadic um, empire-wide um, persecutions and then the, the also sporadic uh, localized persecutions, you had uh, it really a, a, a double process. On the one hand, you had increasing respect among pagans and uh, Romans generally for Christians. Um, it was it was apparent uh, by the by the time you get to the early fourth century when Constantine is emperor, it's apparent that um, the uh, the Christians are peaceable. They're not uh, they're not trying to overthrow the Roman Empire. They're not a threat to the Roman Empire, and yet they're being uh, uh, on occasion, at least, hounded and and uh, put into coliseums and crucified and uh, uh, slaughtered in various ways. So um, there's a there's on the one hand there's a growing respect for the uh, for Christians among the populace uh, po- population of the Roman Empire and a growing church. Uh, by the time the Constantine came on the, came on the scene, then estimates are pretty hard to come by, but then. The consensus seems to be that somewhere in the vicinity of ten percent of the population of the Roman Empire was Christian. So, um, so there's a there's that process. There's also the the kind of reverse trend that is becoming in, in, it becoming increasingly clear that the persecutions are not working. And I think there are things inherent in the in the uh, nature of Christian faith that makes the you know trying to persecute the church out of existence is never going to work. It's uh, a faith that uh, confesses uh, the, uh, that, that, that a crucified man was the Son of God, uh, that he rose from the dead. Um, the martyrs believed that they were sharing in the sufferings of Christ when they went to their own crosses or were set into the Colosseum to fight, fight gladiators or whatever. So they, uh, they don't, they aren't, um, this, is, this is not a movement that you can suppress by, threat, by threats. And so, through the through the first few centuries of, of the Christian Church, there's a um, there's a growing uh, sense of impotence, I think, uh, among Roman emper- empire, emperors, a growing recognition that there's going to have to be some accommodation to this movement, um, that they're going to have to that they're not going to be able to suppress it, and that uh, the, the the martyrs are actually uh, exposing something of the weakness of uh, of Roman power. Now, this is a point that. Um, a Yale law professor named Paul Kahn makes in several of his books. Uh, he says that the the Western Western political life has been overshadowed by uh, the haunting the haunting fear of martyrs. Um, regime uh, regimes are always worried that there are going to be courageous witnesses that won't buckle to the sword, won't buckle to persecution, uh, that uh, will will flourish in the midst of persecution. And that's really what that's the that's the fear that kind of restrains power in in the West, according to Khan. And I think you see that going on, particularly as you get to the latter part of the uh, third century and into the early fourth century. The great final persecution is carried out by Diocletian, uh, and it's uh, it becomes clear at that point that there's uh, there's no way that this movement is going to be uh, uh, intimidated or slaughtered out of existence. So that's that's the setting in which Constantine comes into uh, power, and it's um, it's a um, again it's it's a it's a setting in which the um, 
some accommodation to Christianity seems almost inevitable. Uh, it, you know, it, uh, given the dynamics I've just described, it's not that um, you have this persecuting empire and then there's this uh, uh, in sudden immediate reversal. That's true in some respects, but in other sense, you have uh, processes going on in the first few centuries that are kind of leading to leading Rome to um, look for ways of accommodating to the Christian Church. Mm-hmm. Now, when you talked about uh, the persecution, I want to make sure because. It sounds like there can be two extremes you can make. We can make the mistake of thinking that Christians were constantly running for their lives everywhere they went. Or you, we could, on the other hand, make the mistake of, say, Candida Moss, if we broke the myth of persecution and saying, no, all these persecution accounts were just overblown. It wasn't really like that. So you're saying we have to find a happy medium, right? Right, yeah. Neither. I don't think either of those positions are, are correct. And I think that, you know, the... Uh, it's 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 one thing to say um, as uh, I understand Moss does. I haven't read her book, but I, as I understand the argument from mm-hmm. from uh, things I've read about it, and then if you just line up the number of people that are killed and the the years during which the the Christian Church is officially illegal uh, throughout the empire, that's a fraction of the time period leading up to the time of Constantine. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. But even if that's the case, as I said, there are, that it's the instability of the situation, the ambiguity is the legal situation that, that's as threatening and as dangerous as anything. Um, again, you have situations similar to that in the, in the I think of China, where uh, you have uh, crackdowns and relaxations and crackdowns and relaxations that happened in the Soviet Union during the, uh, in Russia during the Soviet years. So, um, and what that, that leaves Christians uh, with a, a sense of never knowing where they stand with regard to the government. Um, and it does, I think there's a, it, um, it is a situation, of, it's not a situation of constant persecution, but it's a situation of the constant potential for persecution. Well, I, I do know a little bit about what happened with Diocletian, but just in case our audience doesn't know, could you describe for persecution under Diocletian? Yeah, well, it's, it starts with, um, with a, uh, a situ- uh, with an incident, this I, I start my book with, with this um, with this incident where Diocletian is uh, offering a sacrifice, um, and I'm forgetting the exact circumstances of that at the moment. I think that it has to do. It's like most uh, uh, emperors, he would be offering sacrifice before he does some kind of official um, uh, takes does some kind of official action. I mean, the uh, sacrifice was a way of gaining the favor of the gods for whatever you were about to do. It's, uh, it's integral to the Roman political system. Um, so he's, he begins by, he's offering a sacrifice and, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, they're specialists in reading entrails and they try to read the entrails and there's, uh, um, there's, there, there are, um, you know, the, the sacrifice is not accepted. There are bad omens in the sacrifice and that, leads uh, Diocletian to begin, it, it, consults a, it consults with a seer or prophet who tells him that there are unbelievers of some sort within the, within the, uh, um, uh, in the company of people that are there at the sacrifice. People don't believe in the Roman gods. And so they're actually, and they're Christians, he actually finds that there are Christians in the um, emperor's entourage, and that's what begins the persecution, because he, it starts out with this failed sacrifice and he's looking for um, looking for the culprits that uh, that prevented the sacrifice from being accepted. Um, and the, it's a, it is a it is a um, uh, an empire wide empire wide uh, uh, persecution for a while. And by the by the time Diocletian Diocletian was a kind of unique emperor. He he retires from being emperor at some point and splits up the empire into a tetrarchy, tetrarchy so that there are several uh, there are two emperors in the east two emperors in the west and they're dividing up power and at different times in the aftermath of Diocletian's reign you have a um, you have di- a different uh, legal situation for Christians in the east and the west and you also have different levels of enforcement the fact that the fact that a Roman emperor had decreed something doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be enforced fully um i mean even even with our uh 
instant modes of communication today, you still have bureaucrats that, well, we've seen a little bit of this in the, in the early days of the Trump administration, bureaucrats who don't like the policies that have been adopted, and so they either drag their feet or they refuse to enforce them. And, uh, the, I mean, when you have the situation like you did in ancient Rome where the communications was much more, um, much slower, um, and you had the same kind of situation. So the fact that an emperor would decree something would not necessarily mean that it would get, would get enforced. And so there's a, even, even under Diocletian's, uh, under Diocletian's decree, there's a, the per- persecutions were not uh, enforced in the same way in all parts of the em- emperor, empire. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Constantine's father, for example, was one of the tetrarchs, and uh, for reasons that are still a little bit obscure, uh, he's reluctant to enforce the decrees and uh, doesn't he doesn't bear down on Christians in the same way that some others do. Later on, uh, one of the Eastern emperors, Galerius, um, decides to uh, issues a decree near nearing death. He issues a decree of toleration uh, in the eastern part of the empire. Um, so um, this is, but this is the last of the this is the last of the empire wide persecutions of the Roman world, and it's uh, comes just before Constantine takes power as first of all as one of the tetrarchs, and then eventually as the sole emperor of Rome. Mm-hmm. And when you were talking about, it, there are two things that were coming to my mind. First off, how Tertullian talked about hit the persecution in his time and how it couldn't be stopped because he said the blood of a martyr is the seed of a church. And then about uh, Larry Hurtado's recent book, Destroyer of the Gods, which we interviewed him on on this show, if listeners want to go back and find that, about mm-hmm. how the, uh, the persecution the Christians underwent often couldn't be official persecution, but ostracism and shaming mm-hmm. in society because they were outcast. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's a, uh, well, on the first point, I think Tertullian uh, is uh, exactly right, and I think that's it's not. Um, uh, I think that's a biblical insight. That seems to be something that New Testament um, indicates. Uh, I've, been, I've been working for the last few years on a commentary on Revelation, and uh, uh, martyrdom is a central theme of the whole book, and mm-hmm. and particularly the vindication of martyrs. Uh, the first time you see martyrs, that the base of their souls are at the base of the altar, crying out for vindication and vengeance. Mm-hmm. Um, and through the course of the book, you eventually see them uh, martyred, harvested. You see more martyrs. They're harvested. They're exalted into the into the into heaven, and they join the heavenly heavenly uh, liturgy. Uh, so the the trajectory of the book is that um, the martyrs are vindicated, but also that the the blood of the martyrs is poured out on the persecutors, which ends up uh, you know overthrowing the overthrowing the city that's persecuting the martyrs. So I think that process that Tertullian is describing is exactly right. Uh, God vindicates his his faithful witnesses, and um, persecutors end up um, end up in bad in bad shape. Uh, mm-hmm. Lactantius, one of the uh, uh, a Latin uh, father, church father of uh, uh, of Constantine's time, one, uh, actually a tutor in Constantine's court at one point, uh, wrote a book called "On the Deaths of the Persecutors," and he. Uh, gives a lengthy description of all the gruesome deaths that the persecuting emperors went through, mm-hmm. uh, and he's making that very that very point that God ben, uh, vindicates his um, vindicates the martyrs. Yeah, the the point that you mentioned from Hurtado that's uh, interesting that yeah, the the persecution is not always taking the form of uh, you know uh, uh, the church becoming strictly illegal, nor necessarily taking the form of Christians being arrested. You had you have uh, especially early on you have circulating rumors the, the kind of the standard uh, the standard charges or standard slanders against the church are that they are uh, guilty of uh, atheism because they don't worship the Roman gods they don't offer sacrifice to the Roman gods uh, they're guilty of incest because they uh, are uh, speak to one another as brother and sister and they greet one another with a holy kiss and they're considered cannibals because they're Claim to be consuming the body and blood of Jesus. So mm-hmm. those kind of those kinds of uh, 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 rumors and slanders were circulating in the early church too. So yeah, the persecution would be not only direct physical pursuit or arrest and punishment, but it would also include those kind of social uh, forms of social marginalization. 
Now, with Diocletian's persecution also, one thing I think he did that a lot of others before him hadn't done was he tried to destroy the New Testament entirely as well, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. Isn't it amazing, Finn, that we have so many copies of the New Testament from that time period even after what Diocletian did? Yeah, yeah, it is uh, it is almost as if uh, there's somebody preserving the Bible for our, for our use. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that might seem a bit bizarre, though. But, um, yeah, and if anyone wants to know about the text of a New Testament and such, go back to, I think, April of 2014, my interview with Daniel Wallace on this show, and, yeah, you'll hear about that then. But, so now we got this time, the church has just been through what's quite likely the greatest persecution they've gone through. And here shows up this guy named Constantine, who's pretty much a pagan at the time, isn't he? He, he is, although uh, there's, again, there's some evidence that his father had knowledge of Christian Christianity and some sympathy for it. Not that uh, It's not the evidence that he was a believer. There is some evidence that um, Constantine's mother was a believer, and that's, that's a common mm-hmm. um, claim from uh, early writers, and uh, uh, I don't think that can be confirmed uh, for sure, but... Uh, there's, there's at least some uh, sympathy and uh, toleration for Christianity in his surroundings as he's growing up. But no, he's, he wasn't a believer um, at the time of uh, when he first took, took, uh, uh, took the position as one of the Tetrarchs. Isn't, uh, his, go ahead. isn't his mother, Helena, supposed to be one even who went and, according to the legend, found the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and where Jesus was said to have been crucified, to have been buried? Yeah, right. Yeah, she. Yeah, she's. Uh, there's a. Uh, there are many legends about her. Um, the discovery of the true cross and and so on. Right. Uh, the, I'm, I, th- I was thinking earlier the whether she was a whether she was a Christian prior to Constantine ah, okay. becoming emperor. Sorry. The uh, you know the, that setting in that setting it's not clear that she was a believer. There, there's a lot of legends about her being a uh, uh, being a um, you know being a devout believer later and. Uh, uh, supporting churches in in Jerusalem and being involved in some way in finding the the relic of the true cross, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that I mean that's one of the questions that that a lot of evangelical Christians ask is whether um, Constantine was genuinely converted. Is there is this a somebody who, who was uh, really a Christian at some point, or was he um, just shrewdly managing public opinion? Uh, was he shrewdly enlisting? Uh, this strong minority within the Roman Empire on into his, uh, you know, t- to try to get their support for his uh, for his reign. Um, and that's a that's a fairly uh, uh, that's a nineteenth century opinion um, that uh, has been has has really carried on more in Christian circles than in um, among. Uh, academic historians, and, and it's uh, what was one of the things that uh, uh, I, uh, surprised me when I first started research on the book was the discrepancy between the way theologians and Christian writers spoke about Constantine and the way that historians did. Um, historians would uh, uh, take it uh, almost for granted that he was a Christian of some sort. They took his claims to be a Christian and other people's claims that he was a Christian at face value. And um, a lot of Christians were stuck in this 19th century position um, that uh, was first articulated by Jakob Burkhardt um, uh, and claimed that uh, Constantine was kind of a, um, a, a, a modern politician, a Machiavellian politician almost, mm-hmm. uh, manipulating public opinion and Trying to take positions that would gain him support, but what was not really convinced of the of what he was, uh, what he uh, of the faith he was associating himself mm-hmm. with. And I, I I came to the conclusion in my book that he was in fact converted. I think the um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second about the, the evidence for that. Um, but the I think it's it is important to recognize uh, both the um, 
you know, what the nature of conversion in the fourth century, what that would look like, which is not necessarily what it would look like in a 19th century revival meeting or 20th century revival meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and, all, and also what, a convert, what conversion would look like to an, to an experienced, uh, fairly, uh, a fairly uh, uh, an experienced, highly successful Roman soldier. Um, conversion is not going to have the same kind of uh, appearance that it has with the um, uh, with a housewife in uh, 20th century America, 21st century America. Mm -hmm. So, Ben, I'm sure that's going to be some very curious for my audience because, you know, today we think, well, you're in a church service, you hear the gospel, you walk down the aisle, you pray, you receive Christ, you go home. And you <laughs> probably show up later at church, you get baptized next Sunday, and that, that's how it happens. So what was mm -hmm. different back then? Well, uh, there'd be a number of things that would be different, uh, uh, part of it was the, just the character of what, uh, the way that religion was conceived of. Um, and uh, religion has uh, thought of not as a uh, strictly private kind of belief system or way of piety. It would include that, certainly. But religion was inherently a public matter. Uh, Roman religion, as I mentioned earlier, was all integrated, was integrated fully with the Roman Empire. Um, you, uh, emperors sacrificed the whole, the whole goal of emperors was to keep the gods happy so that the gods would bless Rome, so that the gods would provide um, uh, success and triumphs for the Roman Empire. To jump in like quick, what you're, brief, yeah. but what you're saying also is our concept of separation of church and state would make no sense to them whatsoever. <laughs> exactly right, yeah. So the Romans would have thought that, and when, when Constantine converts, he doesn't instantly become like James, uh, James Madison. He doesn't suddenly become a believer in the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, he still thinks of religion in the same way that the Romans did. Um, and a lot of the public statements he makes about the Christian religion have that kind of political dimension to them. He talks about uh, trying to, well, for example, when he calls the, uh, when, he's, when he assembles the, the uh, uh, Council of Nicaea in order to deal with the heretic Arian uh, controversy. Um, he does it because he is afraid that the divisions in the church are going to displease God, and if God is displeased, then he won't continue to bless the Roman Empire. So the logic is still he's doing what he does in order to please God so that God provides um, um, political and material blessings for Rome. What's different is that he now believes that it's the God of the Christians that's the one that needs to be uh, that needs to be honored and pleased. Um, so, the, but that's that's a I think that's a pretty clear example of how things would be how things would be different um, for Constantine. I think that another dimension of this uh, is, uh, and I do want to get to the you know the legends of his conversion and some of the evidence surrounding it uh, because I think that's sounds some, some interesting parts of that. But the uh, another interesting. The, aspect of this is that Constantine, uh, although professing uh, to worship in, uh, the Christian God and to believe the Christian God, wasn't baptized until his deathbed. Mm -hmm. And the accounts that we have, at least, we don't, you know, uh, these are secondhand accounts at best, so we don't know uh, whether this is a, an accurate way of portrayal of what his, his baptism is like. But in Eusebius' life of Constantine, um, Constantine treats that as his entry into a new way of life. Uh, he, uh, as soon as he's baptized, he removes his uh, imperial robes, never puts them back on. Uh, he thinks of himself as now being prepared to be, being prepared to die, now fully becoming a Christian. So I think Constantine, even even though he was professing uh, to worship and what uh, you know was engaged in the worship of uh, the Christian God still was somewhat aware that he was uh, at, at the edges of the Christian church. He was never a member of the Christian church in the sense that he was baptized and incorporated into the community um, until, until, again, right at the end of his life. And I think that's, a, that's different from later, later Christian emperors, uh, later, the later situation of Christendom where emperors would have been baptized and would have been members of the church and therefore under the discipline of clergy, uh, which... Um, is what that's the setup that led to some of the famous 
encounters, the showdowns that you have in the in the medieval period. But that was not Constantine's situation, so it's always kind of marginal to the church and um, uh, doesn't again doesn't fully enter it until uh, until later. And then it seems to indicate that again Eusebius's account uh, suggests that he uh, he would have uh, it almost suggests that he would have seen baptism as a as something incompatible with his life as an emperor. That's the way that um, that's the impression you get from. Um, Eusebius's account that uh, if he had been baptized earlier, he would have had to give up his imperial uh, position earlier. Mm-hmm. So he he retains he stands kind of on the margins in order to in order to support the church and provide for it and protect it, uh, but not wholly enter it. Now, since you mentioned the Council of Nicaea, I think we should really spend a lot of time talking about it because that's such a big heated thing here, and we can go back to some other points earlier, but. What really was the Council of Nicaea exactly? Yeah, well, the Council of Nicaea was an effort to deal with a, with the uh, heresy of uh, Arius and the followers of Arius, uh, who was uh, a uh, uh, Christian leader in uh, Ale- uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and was um, the, uh, the the center of his position had to do with his view of the. Uh, the Son of God, um, and the slogan that was used was that the uh, there was when he was not, uh, often interpreted as there was a time when he was not. Uh, that is, there was a there was a time when the Son of God did not exist, um, and so the the Son is uh, the Son who becomes Jesus is a, a high exalted being. He is the highest and most um, uh, glorious creature that could possibly exist. Uh, and yet, he's not eternally God, and he's not eternally one with the Father. Um, so that was, that, that, was the, that was the position that was being dealt with at um, the Council of Nicaea. Um, Athanasius, of course, is the uh, a primary opponent of Arius and uh, mounts various biblical and theological arguments against the Arian position. Mm-hmm. Some of the more interesting ones have to do with the, um, uh, the, the claim that uh, for uh, that, that Arius's position doesn't just uh, uh, imply that, or claim that the Son of God is less than fully God, but it also makes, it implies certain things about the Father, which, um, according to Athanasius, are insults to the Father, right? The most obvious one is that the Father is himself not eternally Father, uh, because fathers, by definition, are fathers of uh, children, fathers of sons and daughters. So if the Son isn't eternally Son, then the Father can't be eternally Father. Uh, and if he's not eternally Father, we don't, we really don't know what he is, because we, you know, what was he, what was he really before he created a Son? Um, and, or, um, uh, and, and you also imply a certain kind of change, not just in the son becoming a, being a creature, but you also apply a certain kind of change in the father. If the father is, first of all, not a father, and then he creates a son, and then he becomes a father, then there's a, the father himself is not, um, not eternally the same. He's not unchangeable. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the, uh, Athanasius argues that um, for... Uh, if uh, if Arius is right, then the father is eternally barren. He uses language like barren or fruitless. Um, if if the father isn't eternally begetting a son, if he doesn't have an eternal son, then he's a uh, he's like a barren field that then becomes fruitful. But again, you have then then you're you're uh, raising questions about the father's immutability, and you're also that's the point where. where uh, Athanasius claims that Arius is just insulting the father because he's claiming that the father is an unproductive and barren father or a barren god. Um, so that's uh, Athanasius really, I think, really penetratingly grasps what's at stake, and that what's at stake is certainly the uh, the eternal Son of God um, uh, becoming flesh for our sake and going to the cross for our sake. The whole gospel story depends on God being the one that do, that's doing that for us. 
But then you also think very penetratingly shows that the the uh, the denials about the son also uh, uh, have hold implications for the for the father as well. Mm-hmm. So that's the issue that the Council of Nicaea de- tries to deal with. Now there are some myths if you go online about the Council of Nicaea. <laughs> so I can deal with those very quickly. What about the claim that the canon of the New Testament was decided at the Council of Nicaea? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, the, I have, I have, I think, um, fairly uh, um, uh, non-mainstream views of the, the uh, formulation of the canon, the development of the canon. I mean, the, the earliest, the earliest listing of all the books that we have in the New Testament comes from um, an Easter letter of Athanasius. So there is a mm-hmm. the time period is right, uh, but I think uh, it seems to me that the uh, the the uh, Canon formation. There's evidence of canon formation already going on in the in the New Testament itself. Um, you know, Peter talks about uh, 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 Paul's writings as as if they were um, uh, as if they were uh, uh, collection of scripture. Um, I think that Second uh, uh, Peter one, when it talks about uh, scripture being inspired by God, what you know, what Peter is just been citing our prophecies concerning uh, Jesus coming that are recorded in the Gospels. And then uh, Peter goes on to talk about Scripture being uh, uh, written by holy men who are born by the Holy Spirit. So there's, a, I think that there's the implication that uh, the things that are recorded in the Gospel are also being, uh, are also being regarded as Scripture. So I think, I think there's evidence within the New Testament that the canon is being formed Mm-hmm. And it just just as a kind of broad historical or historical point, um, you know, Jews had a, had for centuries had a collection of books that was the um, you know very central to their life as a community and to individual piety and to uh, to the communication of the faith to future generations. It doesn't make any sense to think that. Now that the Messiah has come, they're going to wait several hundred years before they decide to collect books that are authoritative for the community. And that's not um, that doesn't make any historical sense for Jews to do that. I think the Gospels uh, uh, were written quite early. Um, Paul's writing early, and his his uh, book his uh, letters are being circulated through the churches and being read in the churches. And I think there's evidence that they're being collected and treated as um, as uh, scripture. Now, there are some people who think that at the Council of Nicaea, the Council reached its decision because Constantine came in and ordered them to go this way, that he controlled how the meeting went. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, common, that's a common myth that he's taking over the church. I think that uh, it's certainly not the case. The accounts that we have uh, uh, of uh, Constantine's involvement, he's, he's not, um, uh, he, didn't, he didn't control the the outcome. He didn't control the deliberations. He facilitated the gathering of uh, bishops and priests for the for the for the for the council. Uh, he provided protection if you know if that was necessary. Provided funding, um, so he get, he lent the support of the Roman Empire to it. Empire to it, uh, and he addressed the council uh, again from the the evidence that we have. He did a, did speak in the council, uh, and one would expect that. Um, you know, just the emperor being the emperor would have a certain kind of weight in that kind of setting. Um, but I think he was, he was quite aware that he was not, that it was not his, his job to uh, decide this theological point. Um, and he let, I think he facilitated it and left it to the, to the uh, clergy to uh, make that determination. I mean, that's, that's not, uh, this, uh, one did, this kind of circles back to the, uh, some of the evidence that we have for his conversion. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's, it, it's not the case as some people think that uh, Constantine was theologically illiterate. That's, that's not why he would have left it to the bishops. Although I, I, certainly he would consider the bishops to be the ones to properly make decisions about dogma. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, there's a, uh, it, it, it attached to the end of Eusebius's um, life of Constantine is a, mm-hmm a sermon of Constantine's, um, 
according to Eusebius, Constantine turned the court almost into a kind of a Sunday school and would regularly give addresses, theological addresses, to the assembled members of the court. And uh, Eusebius claims that there were many of these addresses. He provides only one example of it, which is called a, a oration to the assembly of saints. And in that oration, it, it's clear that uh, uh, Constantine uh, knows what the circumstances are, or, or knows what the issues are in the Arian debate. Uh, he talks about the distinction between natural generation and eternal uh, generation, divine generation, which is an, a distinction that's formulated in, in, the, in the debate concerning Arius. Um, and he affirms the eternal generation of the Son, uh, and also indicates that he knows something about the gospel story. He talks a little bit about some types of Old Testament, uh, types of Christ in the Old Testament. So um, uh, uh, there's been some debate among scholars about whether that is a, a genuine document from Constantine. Uh, the consensus uh, of those that I read was that it was Constantine's, something that Constantine delivered and that he wrote. Um, no doubt he would have had assistance from, um, you know, the priests who were around him, people who were uh, knew the Bible better and knew the issues in theology. But it, 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 it's an indication that he did have some facility with the issues at the Council of Nicaea. So the fact that he, the fact that he didn't control the council, um, is, doesn't doesn't arrive uh, from doesn't arise from the fact that he's incapable of following the, the arguments. He knew what the arguments were. I think it has more to do with the sense of recognizing whose whose role it is to decide such things. Now, if we go back in time to when the Da Vinci Code came out, many of us can remember that we were told by the great historian Teabing that the deity of Christ was invented at the Council of Nicaea, and not only was it invented, it was decided by a rather close vote. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know uh, how close the vote is, but I'd still like to hear what you, you answer about all of this. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, uh, it's not, this is not a reliable historian. And I, I imagine that uh, many of your listeners are aware of that. Um, yeah, uh, uh, that's a, uh, a theory that is, uh, it's not a, it's not uh, original with Dan Brown. I, I doubt that much is original with Dan Brown, but um, it's a, you know. But it's also not a true theory. Um, you know, the the um, it's hard to know where to start to respond to that. But I, I guess I go back again to question about the New Testament itself. You, know, you can go to passages of the New Testament that have historically been uh, cited as proofs of the the eternal divinity of Christ, which I think are valid proofs. Uh, they're the proofs that are used by Athana Athanasius and others during the Arian controversy. They have a long history of being texts that uh, are cited in, in, uh, in proof of the deity of Christ. Mm -hmm. But I think if, if you, uh, if you step back and think about, um, the new Testament, um, the New Testament more generally, and, and not just look for individual texts. Um, for example, um, the, the, the titles, names, and designations that are given to Jesus, the very fact that he's called Kurios, uh, Lord Jesus, um, you put that language back into the first century um, um, Jewish, largely Jewish context of the of the. Uh, of the New Testament, and um, that doesn't just mean master. Uh, that has connotations of of, of this. Kurios is the Greek word that's used to translate the name of uh, Kurios. Uh, uh, uses a, a, a translate the name of God in the Septuagint of the Greek Old Testament. Uh, it's a divine title. Um, passages that are um, so that every time that Jesus is called Lord, there's this overtone that Jesus is uh, is uh, uh, divine. He's he's called the Savior. Well, any Jew who's read Isaiah knows that there's only one Savior, and that's uh, Yahweh, God of Israel. So the very fact that Jesus is called Savior, which he is 
regularly in the New Testament, uh, is, is again an indication that he's he's being um, he's being honored as a divine figure. So uh, the, the idea that that's that that is something that came very late um, that that doesn't hold at all. Uh, and you can go further into the uh, the earliest of the church fathers, and you can find you can find plenty of evidence of the same, of the same sort. But uh, mm-hmm. I think it's. It's there in the New Testament. I don't think it's only there in a few isolated texts. I think it's all over the New Testament. And what about the question of a vote of an Isia? Was it really that close? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I've heard it was like a 358 to 2 or so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't remember the exact. I don't remember the exact numbers. I, I don't remember the exact numbers of uh, the members who were present at the Nicene Council, but uh, it was not a close vote. No. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the debate over Arianism actually takes place in the aftermath of the Council of Nicaea. Mm-hmm. Uh, we tend to think that that resolves the issue, um, and it does in a sense because the the language, the technical terminology that's adopted at Nicaea stands. And is uh, affirmed by the Council of Constantinople some uh, sixty years later, fifty-five years later. But um, the uh, uh, a lot of the a lot of the debate is actually taking place after uh, a lot of the, the the things that Athanasius writes are written after the Council mm-hmm. of Nicaea, mm-hmm. um, and they're dealing with um, um, some people challenging the the. the uh, the decision of the council, certainly, but also just trying to figure out what the decision of the council entails. You know, um, what uh, the the uh, the use of the term homoousios, the same substance, um, somewhat controversial, just because it's a non-biblical term, an extra-biblical term. So Athanasius has to defend the uh, the use of uh, extra-biblical terminology in theology. It's also controversial because it can be interpreted in different ways. It can be interpreted in a Kind of non-trinitarian fashion, um, and uh, so there, there's a there's a, there's a uh, uh, um, worries and struggles over the uh, the meaning of the of the term uh, and and the and the significance of the council. Mm-hmm. Now, when we go back earlier still in church history, now there are some things. There are some uh, even Christian writers sometimes get wrong, and that's a uh, Constantine did not make Christianity the official religion of a Roman Empire. Right? Uh, are you asking me to comment on that on that statement? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's correct. Uh, he did not make it the official um, the official faith of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was that did happen later. It became the official uh, um, the official. Um, religion of the Roman Empire, but that's not, that Constantine did not do that. What Constantine did was to legalize uh, Christianity. After Constantine, Christianity was not under threat in the in the Roman Empire again, mm-hmm. as it had been uh, briefly under Julian, the, the apostate emperor Julian, but um, uh, 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 for the most part, um, it was the, the persecution and Legal ambiguity was an, at an end. Uh, at the same time, it's although he doesn't make the Roman Empire, Empire Christian, uh, there, it's not simply a neutral. Uh, it doesn't adopt a position of neutrality either. Um, there's um, uh, uh, evidence that he, uh, uh, Eusebius claims that he prohibited sacrifice, pagan sacrifice. Um, that's again a controversial statement in some. Historians have claimed that uh, Constantine did not issue any such decree that prohibited sacrifice. Uh, I think that the bulk of the evidence seems to be in the direction of saying that he did, that uh, Eusebius was correct about that. That doesn't mean that it ceased necessarily. As I was saying before, the, the fact that an emperor says something doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be enforced or enforced consistently. But um, at least that's adopting a position, uh, placing the Roman Empire uh, against uh, pagan worship. There were a few pagan temples that were shut down during Constantine's uh, period as emperor, but uh, not all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, 
he, he provided support, financial support and other kind of support for churches. He helped build churches. Um, so there's a, there's a, uh, it's, it's not neutrality t- between paganism and Christianity. It definitely sets up the game to Christianity's favor. And uh, I think the, the, the aim of that is to uh, use kind of a long-term, uh, you know, if you want to use a contemporary buzzword, kind of a long-term missional strategy. Um, he, he doesn't want to, uh, he didn't want to, uh, uh, he knew that suppressing paganism outright would be disruptive, probably didn't want to do that anyway, uh, but um, also was, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of adopted a gradualist approach that favored Christianity, that gave Christianity a prominence and a visibility that it hadn't had, mm-hmm. uh, and um, that made it uh, socially, politically uh, safe, and sometimes even advantageous, advantageous to become a Christian, and over time, uh, it's natural that then the, the Roman Empire would become more Christian, more people would convert out of mixed motives in certainly in some cases. But um, the, the situation is not again. Um, uh, he doesn't establish Christianity as the the faith of the Roman Empire, but he does set things up in uh, to favor Christianity as a as a preferred religion in the Roman Empire. Now, before I get to the next question, since it could be a lengthy answer, I like to remind everyone that you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast. I am Nick Peters, your host. Today with us, we've got Peter Lightheart. He's talking about his book, Defending Constantine. But if you're here with us next week, we've talked a little about, a little about uh, the Arian controversy, and so we're going to be talking about the Trinity a lot more next week. My guest is going to be Dr. Matthew Bates. When he's going to be talking about his new book, The Birth of a Trinity. It's going to be a very interesting discussion, so I hope you'll be here next week for that. Now let's get back to Dr. Lightheart and his talk on defending Constantine. Now, one other charge that's brought against Constantine often is that he was really a worshiper of the Roman god Sol Invictus. And what do we make of this claim? Yeah, and um, uh, uh, there's some complications there. I would say, if you wanted a simple answer, I would say no. <laughs> but I think there are some complications. There are, there are some complications in a, in a couple of directions. Um, and this goes back to the question of Constantine's conversion. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the, there are a couple of different accounts that are sometimes conflated um, of Constantine's conversion. And I, I think that um, I was helped by an article by Peter Weiss, a German scholar, who argues that these are two separate incidents uh, that are separated by a period of several years and that, that cumulatively they lead Constantine to declare his allegiance to the Christian God. Uh, but it's, it's a process that takes place over uh, a number of years. The, the, uh, if you look at you know older paintings of uh, the, the night before the Battle of Milvian Britain, Constantine of uh, I uh, was able to defeat uh, the uh, city of Rome. Uh, you have Constantine in his tent, and there's suddenly the sky is split open, uh, and the angels are coming down out of the sky, uh, carrying cross, carrying a cross, and one of them with a banner that says, "In this sign, conquer." Um, and so there's a sign of a cross and an inscription, uh, flying against what Constantine is supposed to have seen. Um, Weiss argues that what what actually happened was, again, two different incidents. Uh, one of them took place about 310 or so, uh, when Constantine was probably in Gaul somewhere. The, the, the uh, location is a little bit uh, uh, uncertain. But he's marching with his army, and they see a sign in the sky um, that's a public sign. This is not something that he sees only in his own, uh, only in, uh, in his own, in a dream or something, but he sees a... a uh, a sign in the sky um, that looks like the a sign of a cross, and Vice argues that what he actually saw was what's called a sun halo. Uh, there's certain atmospheric conditions that will create a a uh, ring around the sun, uh, and then uh, if you you can go on Google Images if you want to see what this looks like, and you can find uh, sun halos that we have the sun at the center of a circle. 
Uh, and then you have what looks like a cross, beams of light that are forming a cross within the circle. Um, and uh, Weiss thinks that that's what, what Constantine saw. And when, uh, that, when he asked about it, he had, he had some, Christian, um, some Christians in his entourage at the time. He asked about it, and he was told by Christians that this is a sign from the, God, the Christian God. But he, he's, he's looking at a, a solar sign. Um, the, uh, the sun god is, uh, is a, uh, associated with Apollo in part, but a, a, a popular deity at the time, and, and a deity to which constantly might have been devoted in some fashion. Mm-hmm. But he sees a sign in the sky, a solar sign, and it's interpreted as a Christian sign. Um, I mean, for a 4th century, um, relig- century religious person of any kind, a sign, a dramatic sign in the sky like that would be interpreted as a divine portent of some sort, and that's the way that Constant took it. And um, it was given a Christian interpretation. You know, the Christian looking at that sign, the sun with a ring around it, and then um, possibly with beams that look like a cross, a Christian's going to say, well, yeah, then the God who made the sun is giving you a sign. And um, and then the, uh, the separate incident takes place, did take place just before the Battle of the Libyan Bridge, the night before in Constantine uh, has a dream, and that dream is also interpreted as a Christian dream. And in the in the light of those two incidents, uh, he um, goes into the Battle of Milvian Bridge with um, a Christian insignia uh, leading the way. Um, he he uh, puts new signs on the on the shields of his of his army. He he carries a different uh, he carries a different um, uh, insignia into the battle. That might seem like for us. In you know 21st century America, it seems like that's a that's a fairly superficial change. It looks like a change only in uh, externals, but for a fourth century Roman uh, who believed any all, all the Romans would have believed in some fashion and at some level that their wars were uh, fought under the under the under the banner of some god or other, and that Rome won wars only by uh, pleasing the gods uh, for him to make that change in the night before battle indicates that he's convinced that this God of the Christians is going to give him the good, going to give him a victory that um, the gods of the Roman empire couldn't. So it's that, that, that combination of things. So that's why I said it's somewhat complicated because there are, there are, there's a solar sign involved when, when Constantine starts, uh, changing the iconography of his uh, coins and of other things, there's there's often a sign uh, figure involved, uh, it, and it may be that he's deliberately playing off of Roman belief in uh, the a solar god in Apollo, and uh, trying to use his iconography that would uh, that could be read as Christian iconography by Christians and could be read as uh, 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 solar iconography of a. Uh, uh, by, by by pagans, it's possible that he's trying to, you know, kind of uh, uh, not not commit himself one way or the other in the iconography. But the the fact that he makes the shift in his uh, in the symbolism of his army is significant. After the battle, he goes into Rome. After his victory, he goes into Rome, and uh, uh, instead of he doesn't offer the sacrifice to Zeus that, or to Jupiter that would have normally uh, uh, ended a uh, a victory procession. That too is significant. Um, again, we might think of that as purely an external change, but for a Roman, that means he's he's changing loyalty from one god to the other. And from that point on, he whenever he speaks publicly about God, he speaks about the God of Christians as the God that he's uh, that he's following and worshiping. Mm-hmm. Now, what about also charges? If you're talking about Constantine's character, it's often claimed Constantine could not have been a Christian because he murdered his own family. There were, uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of blood in Constantine's story. Uh, partly um, on, in, in the pathway to, and, and a lot of it is members of his own family, his own extended family. Um, the, the, the pathway to his position as emperor involved uh, fighting with a number of uh, relatives, either uh, mostly relatives by marriage, um, and oh, you know, defeating them. Uh, there are uh, charges that he um, that he uh, 
had one of his uh, relatives killed um, after battle. There's uh, the, the uh, um, probably the most scandalous, famous one is one that was, um, there's, there's some incident, there's the, the details are very difficult to, uh, to uh, sort through because there are different accounts of it from different, uh, from different time periods and different sources. Some of the sources are uh, later sources that are deliberately uh, trying to, to paint Constantine as, in its very worst colors. Uh, so there's, uh, there's, a le- uh, there's stories about um, uh, Constantine's wife, Fausta, who is um, uh, found in some kind of compromising position and is, uh, it's, some accounts suggest that she was drowned in the baths. Um, his son, uh, uh, his, his son, um, whose name is escaping me right now, I'm sorry, it'll come back to me, um, at the same time is exiled and eventually executed. And it, uh, one possibility is that uh, Constantine discovered the two of them in, uh, that is, it's an adopted son, Crispus is the name, Crispus is the name of the adopted son, or, or stepson. Um, uh, it's, it's Crispus and Faust, and that he found them in some kind of compromising position a compromising relationship and had um, Fausta killed and sent um, Crispus off to exile and then eventually had him killed. So um, that's the, during his, during his reign after he defeated his, his various, uh, his various um, opponents, rivals, um, that's the most scandalous incident that takes place within, within his family. Well, there's, there's no getting around the fact that he um, killed a lot of members of his extended family. Um, many of these were in the midst of wars and uh, struggles that are part of part of his pathway to power. He he came to came to power as one of the, one of a uh, set of imperial rulers uh, uh, in the Tetrarchy, and uh, eventually. Um, uh, defeated all the all the other members of the tetrarchy and took uh, sole power for the first time since uh, th- th- there's a period of time when uh, between Diocletian and uh, Constantine's sole reign in 313 or 314 um, there's a period of time when they had this uh, a, a number of different emperors and and um, Constantine did uh, have uh, members of his of his extended family. Uh, People related to him by marriage were killed in the in the in those um, uh, in the process of him coming to power. I, I think to say that those are murders is, uh, at least in most cases, is um, probably um, probably not direct, not precisely accurate. But he certainly was. He, he didn't kill them directly, but he was certainly instrumental in killing them. And some of them were um, killed in suspicious circumstances. The most uh, scandalous thing that happened during the course of his uh, course of his reign was uh, involved uh, his son Crispus um, and his wife Fausta. His son Crispus was a son by an earlier marriage, uh, and he had married Fausta as part of a political arrangement. Um, but um, the, there's a, a variety of different accounts of this, and some of them come from sources that are attempting to paint. Constantine in the very worst light, so we're, it's hard to tell exactly what happened. It is, it's not, uh, it's not possible to make this a happy story, though. Something, something awful happened. Um, Fausta, his wife, was found uh, dead, apparently drowned in uh, in the baths. Uh, his son Crispus was sent off into exile and eventually uh, was killed in exile. Uh, and one possibility, although it's not, this is not. Um, certain that this is what happened. One possibility is that Constantine discovered uh, his uh, second wife, Fausta, and his son, Crispus, in a compromising relationship, uh, and that he took action in order to, to stop that. And that, on, that, on that account, it's not... Uh, uh, um, it, it's, uh, it's more like Constantine carrying out a civil or a, a criminal penalty against members of his family but the, the fact that uh, Fausta is said to have died in the baths looks like you know, he's just trying to get rid of her. Um, and Crispus, again, is exiled and then killed. So uh, there's just no way around the fact that he um, uh, 
that there, there's a there's a tremendous scandal here, and Constantine is implicated in the deaths of his wife and his son. Um, so th- uh, that um, so uh, the the title of my book is called Defending Constantine, but I don't defend everything Constantine did, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't defend everything Constantine was. I think there, he certainly was a man with flaws, and he certainly did uh, evil things. Um, that doesn't I don't think that means that he wasn't. Uh, genuinely devoted to and loyal to the Christian God, and uh, or that he wasn't truly a Christian, any more than the fact that David, uh, David's uh, adultery and murder, uh, disqualified him from being king. Yeah. Um, I think we have to admit, and they, they admit that they were these are wrongs, or at least uh, from our distance, they certainly look like things that he uh, that he sins that he committed. But that doesn't. Uh, I don't think that. Um, but that doesn't change my assessment of the overall story about him. I mean, when we talk about defending Constantine, we, we, we're we still finding that happy medium. I mean, we're saying that not everything he did was pure evil and he wasn't the sinister mastermind in church history. But at the same time, we're not ready to nominate him for sainthood exactly either. Right. Although, you know, in the Eastern Church, he is St. <laughs> Constantine, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> There are uh, there are some Christians who consider him a saint, but um, uh, yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. I don't. Uh, there's certainly things that he did um, that I don't uh, I don't think were righteous. Mm. I think when we talk about Constantine, what's usually thought of as most problematic, and this gets us more into what's brought us to our own times, is there you begin the first case of Christianity mixing with the government, and where obviously that can never end well. Or is that obvious? Was it such a bad thing that Christianity and the government began working together? Well, I think that, I, I take a, um, start with a biblical perspective on that, because I think that, uh, um, I think the historical, the historical, um, um, the, his, the historical uh, uh, evidence is mixed, and we have to acknowledge that. But uh, if you if you look at the start with the biblical perspective on that, I think that there's a it, it's pretty clear that uh, it's God's intention from very early on in Israel's history to have kings who are honoring uh, the the true and living God as kings. Uh, not just kings within Israel, but Gentile kings. I mean, uh, um, you go back to the accounts of Abraham's life in Genesis. He's promised an abundant seed. He's promised a land. Among the promises he's given is that kings will come from him. So there's uh, a promise of royalty, royal descent from Abraham right from the beginning. Um, obviously, that gets fulfilled in the Davidic dynasty and to a much lesser extent in the dynasties of the Northern Kingdom, which are uh, usually unfaithful. But the Davidic dynasty is, 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 a mixed, is a mixed dynasty. I mean, you have very faithful, uh, righteous, uh, uh, godly kings uh, uh, inter- uh, 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 juxtaposed to uh, idolaters and murderers. So there's a, you know, the Davidic dynasty is, is, is a mixed dynasty. It's, it's a it's a mixed story, but it's a fulfillment of that Abrahamic of that Abrahamic uh, promise. And then you have a prophetic passages. I think of Psalm two, one of the most quoted passages in the New Testament. But Psalm two ends. It's it's about the turmoil among the nations. God's response to the turmoil is to install His King on Zion, His holy hill, and then ends with an exhortation to kings to kiss the sun, uh, lest he be angry. Um, and so uh, there are passages in the prophets, uh, regular passages in the prophets, that depict Zion uh, as an exalted mountain to which the kings of the earth bring their treasures and uh, to which they come for instruction, for worship. Psalm 2, is, uh, Isaiah 2, rather, is probably the, uh, uh, the best known of those. The, Mount of House, the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. Uh, the nations will bring, will come to learn of God's ways. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Um, and that that vision of the nations coming into Zion is picked up right at the end of the Bible in Revelation 21 with the uh, kings and nations bringing their treasures into the New Jerusalem. So the idea that um, 
the idea that uh, 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 kings as kings in their capacity as political rulers uh, would are to devote themselves to the service of God. That seems to me to be just in, inherent in the in the in the biblical story, uh, and it's uh, it's seems to be part of what's meant when the New Testament talks about the kingdom of God coming. Um, the kingdom of God means that Jesus is installed as God's anointed one on Zion. And if we're following Psalm 2, then the very next thing we should think is, well, then kings, the kings of the earth had better uh, better acknowledge the high king. That's that's the uh, immediate implication. So when we you know, proclaiming the kingdom means calling kings to account. Um, so that's that's the uh, kind of uh, theoretical, theological, biblical perspective on it. When you look at actually how, at, at how that's worked out in the course of uh, course of church history, in the course of political history, um, uh, you know, like the, as the biblical record would would uh, would lead us to expect, it's a it's a mixed it's a mixed picture. Um, uh, there are uh, um, there are a, a lot of uh, uh, faithful godly kings through the history of Christendom. Uh, there are a lot of kings who are and rulers who are uh, brutes and um, who use their power for their own uh, enrichment and their own gain. Uh, there are kings who use their power to uh, defend those who are weak and powerless and without their own defenses, which is what the the Bible indicates they should be doing. And then, of course, there are kings who take advantage of the weak and the powerless for, for their own for their own uh, purposes. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I guess the but the the more subtle question is less to do with individual kings, I think, and just to do with the the idea that politics or the religion is somehow corrupted by being joined to, to politics. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that that perspective is a it's actually historically a fairly recent one in in church history. Um, and then the it would have been it would have been a surprise to uh, most of the churchmen of the Middle Ages, the Western Middle Ages, and and certainly of the Eastern Church uh, through the same period, and a, a surprise to most political leaders that um, Christianity required a separation of religious and political life. That was certainly not what they were uh, aiming to do. And in some ways, I think the um, uh, what Christianity aims at is really a a a, a transformation and uh, of uh, all of life by the power of the spirit and by the power of the gospel that has to include political life as well as anything else. Um, I'd like to, at this point, remind everyone that you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast. Everything we do here is listener supported by people like you. And we very could use your support. I mean, this is a fledgling ministry. You don't have much coming in. So anything you can do is indeed very helpful. Um, if you want to donate, go to my website, deeperwatersapologetics.com. Um, there right now, I'm looking, and there's a link on the side that says, uh, Help Support for Work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. Now, if you uh, if you go there, you'll find uh, a link in there that says, uh, that takes you to the ministry of Risen Jesus. Have you gone to the right place still? Yes, you are. Risen Jesus is a ministry of Mike Lacona and his wife, Debbie. And if you listen to the show, you know, those are my in-laws. And so, if you make your donation to them, then you need to get in touch with me, or my wife, Allie, or Mike, or Debbie, because if you don't tell us, we won't know. And say, hey, I made my donation, I want to go to Nick Peters, I want to go to Deeper Water, or something like that. And we will make sure that the donation goes to us, and it is tax-deductible entirely. Now, you can also support us through Amazon. I've got some ebooks there. One I've written, A Creed for the Ages, the Apostles' Creed, and Today's Christian. And ones I've co-written, such as Defining Inerrancy, or Groundless, looking at Dan Barker, or God and Natural Disasters, a debate on the problem of evil. And finally, guys, we just had Valentine's Day come and go. But just because Valentine's Day has gone doesn't mean you can't show love to your wife. And one of the ways your wife will most likely like to receive love is jewelry. Yet for some strange reason, they seem to very like it. Well, we can help with that. 
Go and support us by purchasing jewelry. There's a link on the side. You click it, the access code is love. Whatever you buy for that lady in your life, 25% of that will go to deeper waters. No increase in our price. Just buy it and we get 25%. Just let us know about it. So guys, as I say, you can buy something special for your wife and support a ministry and you can make up for that screw up that you recently did in the past. <laughs> or you can make a vet screw up that I know you're going to do in the future. I speak from experience on this one. You are going to screw up in the future. Every husband knows it. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Lydart, do you have an organization or a charity you'd like to see people donate to? Yeah, uh, I do. Uh, thanks for that. That was, uh, that was fun to listen to. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, the Theopolis Institute uh, is an organization that uh, I started with some of my colleagues a few years ago. We do uh, uh, primarily uh, leadership training. We do a series of classes in Birmingham, Alabama every year, uh, training uh, training people in uh, particularly in the area of biblical studies and in worship, uh, liturgical theology, and we also deal with some cultural and political questions um, uh, kind of topics that I'm t- discussing today with Nick. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're interested in supporting us, our work there, um, theopolisinstitute.com, and there's a donate mm-hmm. button on the page. And you can also find um, some uh, notices of upcoming courses. You can find articles. We post a couple of articles a week on our blog from pastors and uh, other writers around the country on biblical topics, theological topics, and so on. Uh, that's Theopolis, the city of God. Uh, people often hear it as Theophilus, lover of God. And we do love God, but the name of the organization is Theopolis. So, uh-huh. Thank you. Mm. Thanks for the opportunity to say that. No problem. And I just did a web search, Theopolis Institute, and it brings it right up, theopolisinstitute.com. So go there and make your donations if you want to support Dr. Lighthart and his ministry. So we with the whole thing we were just talking about, with the whole government and Christianity being mixed together. In fact, it's my understanding that if Constantine hadn't had done what he'd done, which eventually led to the Roman Empire becoming Christian, it probably would have happened eventually anyway, because Christians were just growing by the number so rapidly. I think that's I think that's right. There's and the the numbers are deceiving in some ways because. Um as I said, uh, the, um, the the proportion of Christians in the Roman Empire was not uh, huge at the time that Constantine converted. This is one of the one of the reasons why the idea that he's doing uh, that he's manipulating uh, Christian opinion to his own advantage doesn't really make sense because he's a he's appealing to um, a, a comparatively small, uh, uh, not altogether. Um, understood uh, minority in his in the emperor empire it doesn't make much sense for him to unless he's unless he's very prescient and sees where things are headed already it, it would be kind of like Trump maybe reaching out to say the Asian population or the Jewish population here in America which isn't that that's that size of our voting block to go to yeah right but I, I think the, I think those are good examples because the uh, maybe particularly the Jewish population in the states, although all the although small in numbers, uh, it's a cohesive it's a cohesive community that's uh, stretched out over the U.S. It has a certain a certain set of interests that are distinct, um, and you know the Roman Empire wasn't a democracy, so it, so it doesn't function the same way. But I think that you have the same some of the same characteristics of uh, the Christian Church. Um, by the time Constantine takes takes power, the the church is already is a is a um, important presence in a lot of parts of the Roman Empire, and it's it is a it is a um, an empire wide network of communities. Um, by again by the by the by the early fourth century, it's it's throughout the it's throughout the empire, and in in some cases you have. Um, uh, churches that are taking up significant, um, uh, what, what we what we might think of as, as social services. Um, this this happens maybe to a greater extent after the uh, some of the uh, structures of the empire begin to de- decay in the uh, about a century and a half after Constantine. But uh, already in already in his time, you have uh, 
bishops setting up hospitals, for example. Hospitals are a Christian invention. Um, so you have uh, you have um, uh, you know uh, institutions that are designed to, to care for the sick. Uh, you have uh, various forms of poverty relief um, that the church is carrying out. Uh, uh, Rodney Stark is a um, sociologist, religion, and uh, teaches now at Baylor University. He wrote a mm-hmm. book a, a while ago called The Rise of Christianity. Yep. Where he d- describes the Christian church as kind of a renewal movement within uh, uh, Greco Roman cities. So people would, um, people were moving. It was an urbanizing period. This is, this is earlier than the, than the Constantine's period, but it gives an indication of what's happening. It's an urbanizing period. People are moving into the cities from the countryside. Uh, they're, uh, uh, they're placed in a position where they, their, their normal kin networks are gone. Um, they don't have the kind of social support that they would have had in, in their villages and towns. And the church provides those kind of social, that kind of social capital that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's, it's an attractive place for people to end up because they take care of each other. They, they, um, they love each other. They, they say, we know the way to God and we can show you the way to God. That's a, that's a, uh, that's a, um, uh, that's a, that's an attractive sales pitch. So you're right then the although the church was, uh, you know, in terms of sheer numbers is not huge by the early fourth century. It's, uh, it already is having a significant impact in a lot of, uh, cities around the Roman empire. It has this empire wide presence. And, uh, I think you're right that it still had, uh, it was already, the, the process of Christianizing was happening in um, smaller on a smaller scale, um, apart from the emperor converting. Well, I guess one of the more compelling arguments against Constantine would be that um, it, his conversion meant that uh, uh, the church kind of jumped the gun and prematurely took uh, leadership of the empire. And if uh, uh, if you had not had a converted emperor, somebody had somebody who would protect the protect the legal standing of the church, but the church just was allowed to percolate and slowly permeate the Roman empire that that might've been uh, in the long run might've been a more, um, you know, uh, this is, this is a what if kind of thing, but, um, that would be one, one argument against Constantine that he's, that he pushed Christianity, uh, too far, too fast into the, into its, into cultural leadership. Mm. And there that's why we often have so much talk today, I think, about the role of Christianity in government. Because I think very few of us want to have Christianity be married to the government, as it were. I mean, we don't want Christianity to be forced on the people, but we don't want Christianity to be a persecuted faith either. And it leaves Christians, I was wondering, how, how am I supposed to interact with the political process today? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, as a I'll try to get to make this more directly uh, applicable, but um, just as a broad theoretical uh, framework, uh, I, I really came to conc- claim, came to believe that Constantine's uh, way of, uh, uh, of relating to the church uh, was a model that still is it has its uses, it has its has its possibilities in the modern world, and I'm thinking particularly in areas where. Um, uh, you have uh, 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 growing churches, churches that have a growing political clout in certain parts of Africa, for example, um, and um, what? And yet they're in places where there's still uh, widespread um, uh, non-Christian religious practice, and often you know overtly um, pagan, uh, idolatrous practices. What, what, what are what are how should Christian leaders try to set up um, a faithful system in those circumstances? I think Constantine has something to some insight to offer there. Cause again, what he, what he ends up doing is uh, giving favor to the Christian church without, uh, while leaving, um, uh, leaving other religions more or less free to operate. Again, he, he closed, closed down some temples, which uh, usually are temples that were particularly scandalous for one reason or another. Um, and he suppressed certain religious practices, or at least decreed against them, whether they were those decrees were entirely enforced or not. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 system was set up to favor the church. 
But I, I think the, um, I mean, the the premise behind my saying that that's a that's a useful model is that you can't have a government that's religiously neutral. Right. That, that's uh, that's impossible. Mm-hmm. So the government is going to have some kind of position one way or the other. <coughs> excuse me. Are going to have some kind of position one way or the other about even about something as basic as what constitutes a religion. Uh, mm-hmm. Decisions have to be made, for example, about ch- church exempt status, and that means that the government is going to have to make some determinations about what what truly counts as religious practice. Mm-hmm. <coughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. So um, you can't you can't have a religious an entirely religiously neutral system, mm-hmm. and I think that um, given my I'm going to have to cough again. I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm hoping you can edit that. Yes, everything can be edited. Um, give me a second. I'll get some water. Your webcam must be portable Water-hot. because it seems to be following you everywhere you go. <laughs> Okay. Your webcam must be portable. It seems to be following you everywhere you go. I just, I wish I carried my, carried my, uh, laptop. I carried my laptop, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, let me back up and try to get what I was saying before I start, before my coughing fit. About how, how the government can't be yeah. for. Right. Government is religiously neutral, and given what I was uh, saying, the, Kind of trajectory of biblical, of the biblical story, uh, it seems uh, it seems like the, the Bible, uh, uh, or I should say, God, <laughs> intends for uh, rulers and political systems to honor Him. Um, uh, I mean, it seems like that's well, that almost should go without saying. How they honor Him is you know, that's the that's the difficult question. But that they honor Him is. Um, Seems to be uh, pretty obvious for Christians. But one of the one of the ways that Constantine does that, uh, the, the way I put it in the book, is that uh, Constantine showed the honor to the Lord of the Church by uh, respecting the bride of the Church, uh, the bride, uh, which is the Church. And so the the uh, the uh, um, uh, support and protection that he provided for uh, the Church and the Church's. Uh, the church's worship and its institutions uh, is, a, is was a way of honoring Jesus, the Lord of the Church. So uh, I, I say this a, a very broad general framework. When you look at specific things that Constantine did, I think there are there are there are certainly areas where I think that uh, he was operating on premises that are that were natural century imperial premises um, that I think probably. Um, you know, in the abstract, you know, if you can, if you, can, uh, if you could uh, make this a completely a historical hypothetical thing, that w- uh, he, there are intrusions into the church's life that he that were that were damaging, that were unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there, there's certain uh, there's certain areas where uh, uh, he could uh, have could have uh, provided a framework within which the church could operate without uh, without um, uh, intruding. Uh, into the into the churches into the church's business. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of things like um, you know uh, 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 you know 1700 years later, we're happy that Constantine devoted some imperial funding to the building of church buildings. Uh, we can still look at some of them and you know we can admire the structure and be happy that the church, Christian had churches. Mm-hmm. But is that is that something that does that in, does that entangle not just entangled, but does that put the church in a kind of dependent position to the to the state in a in an unhealthy way? I think that there's that would be an example where Constantine probably should have just left the church free to um, to, uh, to to manage its own properties mm-hmm. rather, rather than providing providing for them. So, and I think, but again, he's operating on a pretty standard fourth century premises because the the uh, Roman emperors would have sponsored the creation, the, the building of uh, temples to Roman gods, um, and for the same reason that Constantine wants to build 
uh, house of worship for, for for Christians because he wants to wants to be blessed by the the God that he's honoring. Mm-hmm. Now you said that we can't really have a religiously neutral state. I'm sure some of my atheist friends listening to the show would say, "Nope, you have a secular state that uh, it, that doesn't favor any one religion, and therefore the state is going to be religiously neutral." Yeah, I think that again, I, I, um, as a theological claim, I don't think that's possible, and I think uh, that. But your atheist friends are not going to. Uh, are not going to be swayed by my theological claims. Mm. Um, I think that the, maybe the clearest evidence uh, is to uh, run through some of the recent, uh, you know, some of the recent uh, uh, hot points in American culture wars. Um, can can the state be religiously neutral about something like uh, 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 about uh, abortion rights? Uh, well, the the Supreme Court decision that uh, uh, gave women uh, gave women the right to abort um, explicitly stated that uh, it's it's a, as much as anything it's a it's a uh, establishment of religion argument in Roe v. Wade. Um, mm-hmm. It's an argument of that uh, to th- that the only the only consistent opposition to abortion comes from religious sources. And to maintain those as the basis for an anti-abortion law is uh, amounts to an establishment of a particular religious position. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they they free uh, they they make abortion legal. That's not a neutral position. That's just a non you know that's not neutral certainly for Christians. That's a, taking a, an anti-Christian position on abortion. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, you you could say that uh, you know the the Supreme Court of Court could have adopted a certain kind of neutrality by not deciding the issue at all and by leaving it to the states to decide uh, that would be a more uh, procedural kind of neutrality and that would that might have been the better better option uh, as a you know as we look at the the battles that have taken place over the last forty years um, on the abortion issue. Um, but that's not the position that they took. They they decided that it uh, in the in the interests of non established not establishing religion, they establish a uh, at least at this point they establish a non Christian position concerning the 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 uh, concerning abortion and the life of the fetus. Now, if anyone's interested in abortion, we did just get done doing a month of January where we talked all about abortion with my friends Ty Binbo, Elijah Thompson, Brian Johnson, and we had Christopher Kixor come on talking about abortion. And just go back in our archives and look at shows in January. We try to devote as much as we can to abortion. And I was thinking of another example we could use today is the case of uh, redefining marriage and homosexuality. I mean, the Babylon B even had a satirical article come out yesterday about a new registry made for same-sex couples to choose what Christian floors they want to put out of business. Because <laughs> we, we have had this happen recently over in Washington that a Christian florist was put out of business, or is being put out of business, because she refuses to serve a same-sex couple for a wedding ceremony. Yeah. And, you know, you do not have maybe the Supreme Court could have gone to the states. The states were already voting on this when the Supreme Court overruled several of the right. states. Right, exactly. Yeah, and I think that, uh, I guess, the, again, the uh, thinking of your atheist friends, what the response might be, uh, I, I suspect that one of the responses would be that they're not taking any kind of religious position at all, that they're just um, basing their uh, advocacy of, uh, you know, the right to, uh, same-sex marriage or the right to abortion on a um, on you know constitutionally guaranteed freedoms, but I think it, it, as soon as you penetrate past the the surface of that of that kind of response, then you're inevitably dealing with questions about the nature of human existence. You're talking about uh, creation, whether creation is uh, you know whether. He, you're talking about anthropology. <laughs> You're talking about the nature of man and whether human beings are created male and female. Um, you're taking a position on uh, on uh, what amount to religious uh, issues. You can call them philosophical issues if you like, but they're going to be 
uh, they're going to be uh, 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 issues that Christians deal with theologically and religiously. So I, uh, I don't think that it's a, I don't think it's a fair, or I don't think it's a convincing dodge. I think it is a dodge, but I think it's convincing to say that um, this is not really a religious issue. Uh, uh, that 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 depends on a certain understanding of religion. It, it's not religious in the sense that it's not dependent on God or a divine revelation or um, you know a form of worship. Uh, in the sense. In the sense that it involves uh, basic commitments uh, to absolute uh, principles or absolute realities, uh, in that sense, there are religious issues everywhere in in political life. Mm-hmm. I guess you know, just to just to take a simple make it make the point simply, um, you know, um, the. Uh, in in fourth century Rome, and also in the United States, let's think about fourth century Rome. Back to that for a second. Uh, there were people who were Roman citizens and Christians. Um, it's the same person who is in, in existing in both of those roles, um, and uh, the, uh, the just that the simple fact that you have that you have people playing those dual roles seems to me like you have an inherent overlap and intermixture of religious and political life. Um, the person who's a follower of Jesus um, is going to be a follower of Jesus when he is engaged in his actions as a Roman citizen, whatever that may be. In some cases it might be uh, refusing to engage in certain practices of a Roman citizen. Uh, I'm not going to participate in this, civic sacrifice because it, you're sacrificing to idols and I'm not going to participate in that. Um, but just the fact that you have uh, the individuals who are both religious believers and, and citizens means that you have some kind of, the, the tension is right there within people. It's not a, it's not a theoretical one and it's an inescapable one unless you're going to completely uh, get rid of all religious believers, which is not going to happen. And, or you, you convince religious believers to kind of divide themselves down the middle so that they act like Christians in church and they act like something else outside of church. But that's not, that's not any kind of, um, uh, that's, that's not a uh, uh, viable form of religious practice. Now, there are some Christians, on the other hand, who are saying, you know, we talk so much about trying to change our society and reform the laws and such, and Maybe this is a waste of time. Maybe we should just focus on the gospel and giving the gospel. And, you know, you don't want to get down on Christians and saying, hey, let's give the gospel. Obviously, we should be, but should we just ignore the political process altogether? Well, I, I have some sympathy with that objection, um, and in part because I think um, there is a danger, certainly a danger, of Christians trying to address um what's wrong with the world, whatever that might be, mm-hmm. uh, try to address that through political means. Um, and I, I do think that that's a temptation and it's a, it's a, uh, it's an, it's an error. It's a theological error to think that the world can be made right by, um, by the exercise of power. Um, it truly is the gospel that is the transforming power of God. Uh, and it truly is the ministry of the church that, uh, is the, engine for changing the world. So I have some sympathy for that, for that argument. And, and particularly in the current climate uh, in the, in the, the United States and uh, in the West, I guess, um, because I do think that there's a, uh, I think we're, um, uh, uh, I, I'm convinced that there's a, we're at a, a kind of a, a cultural watershed. We're at a civilizational watershed. And, um, that it's uh, it's a moment that where the the issues go much deeper than uh, can be fixed by political means. We, we could we could change you know uh, the the Supreme Court decisions that Christians don't like could be overturned tomorrow night tomorrow, and we still would have uh, a, a a series of cultural pathologies that that haven't been addressed by that legal change. Um, so I, I do think that the, the stress and the emphasis has to be on 
the church's ministry of the gospel, the church's ministry of the gospel in both word and action. Um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, at Theopolis, one of the main things we emphasize is the centrality of Christian worship as, as, a, as uh, the place where God uh, gives himself to his people uh, so as to transform us into his instruments for mission. So uh, I think the worship, the, the uh, uh, doing, uh, reforming worship according to the word of God is, is, a, is a central uh, task of the time. That's not, um, that's not addressing the political questions directly, but I think downstream it certainly does address the political questions in the same way that, going back to the early church, the same way the early church became politically relevant, not by striving for political relevance, they became a political power by doing churchy things, <laughs> by proclaiming the gospel, serving the poor, you know, standing up for the helpless, uh, starting hospitals. Um, you know, that's the way that the church gains cultural clout by doing the, the by doing the ministry of the church well. And I think that's we're in the same same kind of situation now where that has to be the emphasis. But at the same time, you're right. I don't I don't think we can ignore the political questions. I do think. Uh, that we jump sometimes jump too quickly to those political issues and think that we can solve things by political means. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I liked how you talk about how we're at a watershed moment. I mean, I've even heard it that some people are thinking we could be near a practically another civil war, for instance, right now. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, um, I certainly hope not. Um, uh, I think there are. Yeah, I, I don't know what. Uh, certainly, don't know what the future holds. There certainly, uh, and I, I, I see the dynamics that would lead people to that conclusion. I, I guess I'm, I'm also thinking of something even bigger than just what is going on in the states. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the various various forms of crisis that you have in, in Europe, mm-hmm. and also maybe maybe the bigger story that I've, I've um, tried to keep in in mind through the last uh, the last number of years is the um, the kind of shift in uh, Christian energy uh, and and just the demographic shift in Christianity from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, and um, the the um, the fact that they're uh, vibrant, growing, often chaotic <laughs> uh, Christian movements in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, yeah, and that's a that's a, a huge shift of. Uh, ecclesiast, ecclesi- a huge shift in, in church history, which means a huge shift in world history um, with uh, a lot of the uh, fresh energy and the, the, you know, the, the orthodoxy, um, the, the passion for orthodoxy coming not from uh, the, the West and the and Northern Hemisphere, but from the South. You know, the, in the Anglican Communion, it's, um, it's frequently the Africans who are standing up for um, uh, classic orthodoxy in the Bible, while uh, Americans and Europeans are drifting away. So that's a that's that's a huge shift. Uh, that's a that's an epical shift in in the in the structure of the church and the the uh, and uh, th- that has huge political uh, geopolitical consequences down the road. Already has had. Yeah, I'm thinking back to it. Might be in fact a year or so ago, but some last year that my father-in-law and I were. Out going to an apologetics event together, and we had some time, so we stopped at a subway to get some lunch. And when we were talking about all the political things going on, then he said, Nick, what do you, you think has to be done to turn our country around here? And I said, I'm going to give you the exact same answer that I give every single person who asks that question. The church has to be the church. We have got to get up and get off of our butts and be doing what we were supposed to be doing. To begin with, because I said, the gospel doesn't need America to, to prosper at all. But nope. if America's going to prosper, it needs the gospel. Amen. <laughs> well put. So, what would you say you'd really like us to learn when we look back at Constantine? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, there, there's several things that I think... Um, uh, several things that I tried to draw from uh, Constantine's uh, life and experience. Part of it was uh, a, a lot of the, the book is largely historical, but a lot of the, my reason, personal reason for writing the book was more theological. Mm-hmm. And it had to do with the way that 
as you said at the beginning of the interview, the way that Constantine is portrayed as the the bad boy of um, of church history mm-hmm. and blamed for all kinds of things that uh, I don't think he's responsible for. Um, and so part of part of what I wanted to do was to um, bring uh, Constantine and the whole uh, the whole uh, experiment of a Christian Roman Empire, Empire and of Christendom in Western Europe and uh, Byzantium and Eastern the Eastern Church bring all that uh, into our consciousness as uh, as a resource for thinking about how the church relates to the world and especially how the church is engaged politically. Because I think that one of the dangers of the anti-Constantine, anti-Constantine mentality is that uh, a vast proportion of church history is dismissed as being corrupted by, um, by this alliance between church and state. Um, so I, the, there are lessons to, there are cautionary tales in that history. There are, there are lessons to learn that are negative lessons. That is things that we shouldn't try to do. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of a lot of that history that is instructive to us, and I found a lot of things in Constantine's um, uh, Constantine's work that were instructive. Uh, one, I did one example that I I, I, I haven't brought up, so I, I think it's um, just to give a, uh, a specific example where I think that there's a, um, um, a, 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 a a something to learn from from Constantine, specific thing to learn. One of the one of the evils that a lot of the Roman emperors have tried to address prior to Constantine was the problem of Roman Roman justice in the Roman courts. Uh, the Roman courts were set up <clears throat> not deliberately, but in in effect and in practice uh, to favor uh, wealthy uh, nobility patricians and to um, and to the disadvantage of poor um, litigants. So if if you were if you were a wealthy uh, person of some kind of noble status in the Roman world, you were in the same uh, social class as the judges that you would be appearing before in court. Um, same kind of problem we have today. I mean, you have people who are in the same social circles as judges and politicians, and so they have a kind of undue influence on policy and law. Um, but you also had in the, in the Roman system, you had this setup where Somebody who was wealthy could basically buy um, buy a victory in court just by continuing to appeal. You know, you you go to court. Um, maybe the poorer litigant loses, but the richer litigant can appeal to the next court. The poor litigant has to pay in pay a fee in order to go to the court. He can't pay that fee, and so you win by default because you had the money to keep going. Uh, what, what Constantine did to cut the knot of that problem was to provide for appeals to ecclesiastical courts. So any either of the litigants in a, in a Roman court after after Constantine could take the case into uh, before a, a, a church court presided over usually by the bishop. Um, you didn't have there weren't any fees, so uh, that part of that part of the uh, imbalance was solved. Um, Certainly, you had bishops who were, uh, you know, uh, uh, corrupted. You had bishops who were, uh, you know, intimidated by powerful people, just like you do today. Uh, but you probably also had bishops who were really tough, and bishops who were really just, and wouldn't be intimidated by powerful people, and would. Uh, there, there was a chance for. Uh, weak and poor people to get justice in the Constantinian system that didn't exist prior to Constantine because he enlisted the church as, as a, as a court of appeal for, uh, for the Roman system. So that's, that's an example of a, of a, an area where Constantine is, there's a, there's a kind of, there's certainly an alliance of church and state there. Um, but he's, he's bringing the church into the system in a way that, uh, actually it, uh, provides, um, a better opportunity for justice and certainly a better opportunity for justice for people who can't afford to, to go through the whole appeals process of the, of the, of the normal Roman courts. Mm-hmm. So the, a specific thing like that, that I, I think are worth meditating on musing on what kind of, uh, what kind of possibilities are there for, um, for the church in the present to, to, uh, uh, to follow, follow the lead of the fourth century church. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and again, more broadly, the, the, uh, just the whole, um, uh, the whole system of, uh, post Constantine, uh, Western Christendom, I think has a lot of, uh, a lot to teach us about, um, about how the, how the church should continue to engage in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Dr. I, we've unfortunately come to a closing time here, uh, in case someone wants to find out more about you, do you have a blog, a website, a way people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more? Yes. Um, the TheopolisInstitute.com website uh, is one place. Uh, mm-hmm. I would blog personally at FirstThings.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, Things is a, is a magazine, but they have a pretty extensive website, and I have a personal blog at First Things. So if you, if you go to the website, First Things, uh, click on Web mm-hmm. Resources or something, and you'll find Lightheart. Under that, and I I blog very uh, very regularly there um, so on on a variety of topics. Mm-hmm. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave for the Deep Waters audience? Uh, no, I don't thank you. Thank you, Nick, for having me. I really appreciate the the t- uh, chance to talk with you. I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Well, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, next week. Uh, Matthew Bates is coming on to my Facebook birth of Trinity, and I'd like to thank Dr. Lotto for coming on. Hope we will see you back here again next time. Sometime. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nick. God bless you. For now, I'm Nick Peters, and I'm signing off. <laughs>